Shall we begin the sitter class? If you're sitting comfortably, and I do kind of like how Venerable Pekka gets us to just settle ourselves, our bodies, but I'm going to shorten it slightly. So maybe just one minute of sitting quietly together once you have finished your, you're so welcome to write in your hellos, but yeah, if you've done that already, then maybe just sitting for a minute to land. So just to land in the present moment and the contents of that present moment, whatever they are. And to see if there's any anticipation or inclining of the mind toward the Dhamma already. Anticipation of sharing together and being able to reflect on the very human struggles and sometimes joys that we all have. And I can't contain, so I'm going to <laughs> begin. <laughs> so today we're on page 117, which is uh, the number of a sutta that one of our guests really loves, <laughs> called Mahachattavisaka Sutta. I can never say the name. Anyway, that's 117, Majumunikaya. But we're on page 117 at the moment. And uh, last week, Bernard Balupeka gave a very beautiful sutta discussion on the six principles of cordiality uh, that create affection and respect and conduce to cohesiveness, non-dispute, concord, and to unity. So just to quickly recap that, it was very lovely. And those six principles were bodily, and verbal and mental acts of loving kindness towards one's companions in the monastic life or in ordinary life, both openly and privately. So they're the first three. And then that one shares without reservation any righteous gains that have been righteously attained. In other words, not stolen or taken unlawfully in any way, even including the contents of one's arms bar and uses such things in common with one's companions in the holy life. And the fifth one was that one possesses, again, openly and privately, so you're not putting it on, um, virtuous behavior that is unbroken, flawless, unblemished, unblotched, freeing, praised by the wise, ungrasped and leading to stillness. So it's that commonality, that sort of kindred spirits, if you like, where we hold virtue in common. It doesn't mean obviously that we're all perfect in virtue, but we have a similar standard, a similar aspiration at the very least. And then lastly, that one dwells both openly and privately, possessing in common with one's companions, whether monastics or lay, a view that is noble and emancipating, which leads out for one who acts upon it to the complete destruction of suffering. So the view that leads to the end of suffering is what we mean by right view not right and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm cleverer, but the view that leads out of suffering. And I think that's the most powerful one and the one that really brings community together, but that alone is not enough. We have to actually express our loving kindness in ways that are very, um, that show integrity. So we don't behave one way in public and another way in private. And it also means we include mental training in developing that cordiality. So we have to train our minds to think in wholesome ways, to even speak about others mentally to ourselves in wholesome ways, let alone to others behind their back about one another. So changing the course of our thoughts so that it brings about more happiness and peace. So they're very, very easy and handy ones to hold and uh, to hold in mind. 
And today we're going into a bit more detail with the 10 principles of cordiality. And uh, this is a little bit more specific. And I quite like how it begins because it begins with actually anything but harmony. And based on that, the Buddha um, gives some very specific advice to help to bring around cordiality again. And this is from the Anguttara Tens. So I'll begin reading. And uh, we'll have questions and comments at any time. So if you do have comments, you're welcome to write them in the box. I will prompt you as well, but just write away if you wish. And uh, I'll also pause for any uh, verbal um, contributions to whether questions or reflections or best of all, things that relate to your practice and that could be helpful for you to either clarify or share. So this begins. On one occasion, a number of, let's say, monastics assembled in the assembly hall and were sitting together when they took to arguing and quarreling and fell into dispute, stabbing each other with piercing words. I think we've had this one before because I remember saying to you all that I like the translation, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. Because <laughs> that's sometimes how it feels, you know, they actually are like swords through the heart. They hurt much more even than cutting your finger with the knife. And uh, sometimes the pain lasts all day and even a week or longer. Sometimes it even breaks friendships completely. So this was monastics in the Buddha's day, which is already an important point to make because sometimes people think, oh, you can't get enlightened now, but you used to be able to get enlightened. People are different now than they were in those days. People in those days were so pure and they lived by the Vinaya and they had the Buddha there, you know, surely they were almost saints. But here we have people falling into dispute and stabbing each other with piercing words and quarreling and arguing and, and the Buddha actually has to come out. Um, of his seclusion to address this. So then in the evening, the Blessed One emerged from seclusion and went to the assembly hall where he sat down on the prepared seat. The Blessed One then addressed the monastics. It does say monks, so maybe nuns didn't do this. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> monastics, what discussion were you engaged in just now as you were sitting together here? What was the conversation that was underway? So then they answer, quite honestly, here Bante, and Bante is like venerable, after our meal on returning from our arms round, we assembled in the assembly hall and were sitting together when we took to arguing and quarreling and fell into dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. And then the Buddha replies, monastics or monks, or maybe nuns, it is not suitable for you clansmen who've gone forth out of faith from the household life into homelessness to take to arguing, quarreling, and to fall into a dispute, stabbing each other with piercing words. So it's especially unseemly for people who've gone forth. And, uh, you know, this is related to the purpose of going forth, I think. You know, you've gone forth from home life into homelessness, not because it's some kind of getaway or escape or an easy life, but because you actually um, want to practice the Dhamma. And by wearing the robe, you are naturally um, attracting the attention of others who want to know what is this path all about. And if you actually attract attention in the negative way, then it doesn't give a very good example for the Buddha's teachings. You know, it's, uh, it can actually cause a loss of faith. So the Buddha always said it can create worse karma, actually. I don't know if he said that, but my understanding is it can create worse karma if um, you undertake certain vows that you then fail to keep, really fail to keep, and also um, behave in ways that are really inappropriate when you're a monastic because people have faith and there's a danger that they can lose that faith. Yeah. So as a lay person, you're not so much under scrutiny. There's not so much expectation. You know, you can hide your mistakes. No one's going to know if they see a group of people in the street who's practicing and who's not. So you're not representing the Dhamma in a sense. But as a monastic, you're publicly representing the Dhamma. Whether you feel ready to or not, you are. So basic uh, virtuous conduct, at least at the level of ordinary people, if not a lot better, is required. 
So then the Buddha gives a beautiful discourse to help these monks. There are, monastics, these 10 principles of cordiality that create affection and respect and conduce to cohesiveness, to non-dispute, to concord and to unity. What 10? So I'll read the first one and we'll discuss that a little bit. I'll just open for questions, otherwise uh, we might forget everything before we get to the end. So here, a monastic is virtuous. They dwell restrained by the patimoka, possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing danger in minute faults. Having undertaken the training rules, one trains in them. Since a monastic is virtuous, dwells restrained by the patimoka, is possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing the danger in minute faults, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to cohesiveness, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Hmm. It's interesting because we were just having a conversation before this uh, discussion about samadhi. And uh, I don't think she'll mind that Grace was saying she likes the translation of um, unification. And I was saying something about collectedness and uh, settling of things quietening and we also mentioned the word harmony and it's isn't it interesting that all these words are there included here cohesiveness the bringing together you know mm. the cohering mm. uh the concord in other words harmony you know you're on the same page things are coming mm. together you're together mm. and that unity mm. so there's less diversity in this case of different ways of behavior you know that one's off in this <laughs> particular <laughs> uh, way of speaking and another person's trying to do something else you know so that makes things very difficult and conflicted and the buddha's always trying to bring people together so in a way this is almost almost like already the gathering of energy already a kind of preliminary samadhi if you like a settling so it's really nice just to see that um language and realize how it's very similar and of course, here the Buddha is pointing out that we have to see the danger in minute faults, let alone gross faults, like stabbing each other with verbal daggers, which means really abusive language, right? You just want to hurt each other, like on purpose, not just, ouch, someone was a bit inconsiderate, but, you know, you're actually going all out to, to fight and quarrel. So seeing the danger in the minute faults, realizing that everything matters, actually, um, even the careless speech can hurt people when we don't intend to hurt people. So there's so much scope, not to beat ourselves up, but to just refine our conduct so that we can really become very harmless beings. Having said which, even the Buddha had enemies, you know, even the Buddha had his adversaries, adversaries. So, um, but our job is not to, uh, to obsess about how other people might respond or react, but just to really be honest with ourselves and look inside, you know, and to train in these training rules. So obviously he's bringing to mind the Patimoka because these are the rules that these bhikkhus in this case have undertaken and who are actually flouting um, those rules. So first of all, to remind them that, uh, that these are things they voluntarily undertook right we voluntarily do this because sometimes we think oh it's so unfair we were pressed by these rules and then you forget actually you know as monastics we enter the monastic life not usually at least for people who come to it uh, um they call convert people don't they to in sociology i think or religion there's like the people who are born into it i'm not sure what that's called mm -hmm. and then there are the convert people who definitely voluntarily do it I mean in in our case we were saying this morning my friend was here and she was saying um, um that it's actually not really approved of by our families and societies even if they come around somehow there's always a resistance so we don't do that for fun or for status um so we take these upon ourselves gratefully you know with a heart of gratitude and and uh, have to understand why. So we see the danger in minute faults means we understand the consequence. 
So that's the first one. And I wonder if there are already any questions or comments because we've been speaking a while and, uh, and we're both going to be answering. So if you have anything, yes, we have something from uh, one of our friends in the room and then we'll come to Diana. So this is Sean, who's usually in a box on the screen. So we haven't lost him today. He's actually right here. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um... No, the question is only what is patimoka? Ah, yeah, good point. So the patimoka are the training rules for monastics. These are the, um, you might have heard that monks take 227 uh, precepts, if you like. Um, and bhikkhunis take 311. We're even more highly ordained. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And uh, they include the ethical precepts, you know, the things that are naturally like the basic five precepts, but they obviously include the eight as well. And then they include a lot more which are refinements of those, um, some of which are conventions, monastic conventions that we do, such as not um, um, eating after 12. I mean, that's also one of the eight precepts. Um, but some are kind of a little bit subtler, like, for example, we should. Um, we should acknowledge if we treat another bhikkhuni or I think, yeah, another bhikkhuni with, um, without enough respect, for example. So that's a bit more of a training because we're really looking inside more deeply. Um, so they include lots of things like that and the relationship around things like the opposite gender or, I mean, these days you could say the same gender or any gender, right? <laughs> because uh, it's really protecting our mind. And also protecting uh, the way that we may be regarded by the general public. So not to uh, give cause for doubt in our conduct. Yeah. Uh, that's a party marker. So yes, can we come to Diana? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I have a question that Ling is just putting in the box as well about seeing the danger in the minute faults. And I was wondering if you could speak a little about um, how to balance that with perfectionism, which can be sometimes uh, detrimental if we take it too far. Absolutely. Well, I don't think he's actually saying that we make ourselves see the danger in these things, but I think it's more saying that we learn to over time. Uh, so to me, that's about wisdom in a way, rather than about um, fear. So it's perhaps just learning how, perhaps it's learning initially how the training rules actually help us. And perhaps it's not like you're going to go to hell if you don't do something right, but noticing how they help us and how they help to train the mind and discipline the mind and, uh, you know, settle business because it keeps our life simple. So even that could be a certain danger, right? That if we're kind of veering away this way and that way, we're just complicating our lives unnecessarily. Whereas when we keep something that we've agreed to keep, um, it settles the mind. We feel happy. We feel um we have integrity, you know, we have a feeling that we're we're practicing to the best of our ability. So, yeah, for me personally, I guess that's how I try to balance it, because I also could become too critical otherwise. So I try to see what it's giving me. And then the danger will be losing those benefits, perhaps. And in some cases, it might not be. So, I mean, if you don't see the danger, for example, in my taking of oats in the evening, I don't see the danger. I see a big danger if I don't, because I would actually have to disrobe and that would be well, devastating for me. And I do think at this point, you know, I'm able to be in a position where I can help others and that would deprive people from that help. So there are some things that I might not see danger in, but I'd have to be honest, very honest to that. Um, I don't know, does that help a bit? And maybe there's more, maybe Venable Akeka might like to say. Um, well, I was just thinking with, uh, when something is not, uh, it hurts, mm. it, it hurts, there's something in your mind that closes down. So it's not about becoming someone. It is not about, you know, this uh, somebody, a perfect person, but it is just um, 
open, allowing, removing the things that block your heart, mm. that uh, you feel, oh God, you know, over. Oh, uh, and when when you and and then then the next time when you don't do it you realize oh my that was that was such a relief so it is more a visceral thing mm. and you uh, either contract or you open up and for me mm. that helps me to to um, look at see what what is it what is it that is mm. making me feel so I'm nothing is I'm like, not quite right you know yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. not perfect <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah no that's beautiful actually because it is about the experience it's our inner wisdom isn't it and we're starting to explore you know the consequence of mm. our actions and uh the effect that has on our mind mm. yeah yeah mm. yeah mm. Yeah, what leads to an opening. Yeah, that's very nice. Okay, anything more on those points? Is that okay for Ling as well? You had the same question. Is there any other aspect Mm. of that you'd like to address or or ask about? Okay, you're good. Wonderful. Okay, so the second one, after he's tried to bring them back on track with the training that they undertook, is that... A monastic has learned much, remembers what they have learned, and accumulates what they've learned. Hmm. Because they've forgotten here. (laughs) Very smart. (laughs) Those teachings that are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Mm. Such teachings as these one has learned much of, retained in mind, recited verbally, investigated mentally, and penetrated well by view. Since a monastic has learned much and accumulate, learned much, remembers what they have learned and accumulates what they have learned, (laughs) etc. It's a shame (laughs) sometimes with the dots. Mm -hmm. This is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. So that's quite interesting because here we're saying that first you learn, then you remember and accumulate. So that would obviously keep you on track. And I think that's actually pointing to an aspect of mindfulness, which is um, uh, very um, much the understood translation of smriti in Sanskrit which actually means memory and that's an aspect of mindfulness sati in Pali Um, because if we don't remember what we're supposed to be doing then obviously we can't really implement it you know it's like many people say well you know I want to be mindful but I don't know I just lose my mindfulness and then I forget and it's almost like you've got to remember that you've forgotten first (laughs) before you can actually establish it right so we have to actually notice when these things happen and then remember, oh, hang on, the Buddha said this, the Buddha said that, and the teachings are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing. So I think because it was an oral tradition, that would have meant it was more likely to be remembered. And um, the right meaning of phrasing, I mean, the Buddha was swaka, well, the Dhamma was swakato, perfectly pronounced. So the way that the Buddha explain the Dhamma was so clear and so precise and we were saying earlier you know he used words that were already in popular usage in India but gave them a completely different meaning turned them upside down and gave them a much much deeper meaning um, than they were already being used for for example the word Brahmin you know people wanted to be a Brahmin And they thought that meant you have to be born in a certain caste. And he he completely redefined that word and said, actually, a Brahmin is somebody who's purified their mind and is basically an Arahat, you know, a fully enlightened person. So it's nothing to do with your body or your birth or your skin color. It's everything to do with your conduct and your wisdom. So, um, yeah, the right meaning of phrasing would help you remember, but it would also give you a very good way to understand the practice um, because it claims the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. So if we're a bit off track with that, we might not get the full deal. 
you know we might think we've got some kind of samadhi for example but it's actually a kind of pseudo samadhi that we kind of got into because of willpower or some kind of spiritual materialism and it doesn't sustain itself it might be very similar to the real thing but because it's not based on strong foundations of the other path factors it will just dissipate it will just disappear it won't really have the benefit it should so so we're remembering here and learning and understanding and realizing that you know the teachings bring benefit right from the start so this is also something we were discussing. It's nice when you have a dhamma discussion before a, a, a sort of discussion because we were discussing, you know, kind of, yeah, like, can, can any of us get into samadhi states? And it's like, well, the state isn't really the thing, right? It's more the process because you're getting benefit. The main thing is you should be getting benefit from the practice, whatever way that manifests. You know, if we're looking for only one particular way for it to manifest, then we're going to miss the way it is manifesting in our lives. And there are benefits throughout, you know, however deeply you're practicing, there should be benefits immediately. Yeah. So I don't know if there's much more to say on that or any questions or we could continue. Interesting. That's a, it's a principle of cordiality. Uh-huh. That you, you don't think that everybody, you know, has to be learned or, and, yeah, it's right. the principle of cordiality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a principle of cordiality, probably because yeah. if you remember it, you practice it, and then it inspires others to practice it. Right. Maybe. Right. Mm. You yourself will mm. be practicing. Yes, yes, yes. That because you practice, you are someone who is easy to live with. Yeah. Yeah, and who gives the example because this is about mm. reminding them isn't it that they've gone off track mm. as well mm, 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 mm. so if somebody remembers yes, yes, come yes. on remember like what you've learned and actually and come back to that yeah mm. yeah so mm. this is one reason it's good to keep reading the sutras even if you think you've read them before uh it, it's it's remembering them isn't it it's remembering it so you can go back to it yeah, and then the next one is, uh, is a, yeah, it's sort of like graded this, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> these are the basics. And then the next one is that a monastic has good friends, good companions, and good comrades. So pointing to how easily influenced we are, if, you know, we're around people that are quarreling and disputing, then they've got to quarrel with someone, right? So if you're easily influenced, you'll end up quarreling back. <laughs> uh, but if a monk has good friends good companions good comrades or a nun this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity so yeah this is beautiful too because again it's sometimes we are in a difficult position ourselves or we're feeling down or you know we need a bit of support but if you have good friends they help bring you back on track they lift you up yeah, I was very fortunate this morning because uh, actually I'm very busy and I was planning to do work. But on the other hand, I had a very close Dhamma sister come and visit who I'd wanted Benedict Lupeka to meet for years. And she's a really close Dhamma sister I've known for like years and years. And, uh, and we all sat in my room and we just had a cup of tea for a couple of hours, which is like, whoa, nuns free time. And uh, it was so lovely because we were sort of looking at, you know, priorities and ways to tweak things in the monastery, but also the big picture. And it was just so lovely to be able to be heard as a human being with the little struggles that I and sometimes seemingly big struggles that I have and, and for that all to kind of have a context from someone that's known me for years and years and years, decades. And, uh, you know, two friends who basically see the bigger picture and that sometimes yeah part of the project part of growing the project is to also go on retreat and uh you know and take care of oneself um so that was really nice I felt like I, I sort of did a double take a couple of times I was like oh instead of looking at my computer I'm looking at two very close Dhamma sisters who are now meeting each other and Luna was like oh I think I've known Ben and Pekka before. <laughs> I said, I knew you'd say that. I knew yeah. it. <laughs> so it was really lovely. And it's nice that when we have these good friends and companions, we acknowledge it. We actually express our gratitude because mm -hmm. sometimes they can be around us. Like mm -hmm. I have my wonderful guest here now. 
And we forget to say mm. that we appreciate one another and how much gladness it brings when we do, you know. It, mm. it makes people feel valued and it makes us feel like we're in a good place mm. in our lives to attract mm. other people, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I was also talking about my teacher, mm. my a preceptor, original preceptor in Burma. It was almost like... Mm sometimes scary to think too much about him because sometimes I think he would tell me off for being so busy. <laughs> <laughs> but actually it was just remembering the power of a being who's, you know, really mm. made a big break to end samsara and the metta and the compassion. and the... I mean, he gave me my holy life, you know, and I remember the first time we met, he said, if you ordain, is it for life? And I said, yes. And, you know, because you said that to someone of that caliber, if you like, caliber is a funny word, because the thing is, these aren't beings, these are manifestations of Dhamma. So it's not like there's grades of people, but um, when you say that in front of someone who for you represents Dhamma, it's like a vow. It's almost like, of course I could disrobe, right? But you won't, you just kind of won't. And I really think that's got me through some very difficult times in my monastic life. So this kind of good friendship is extraordinary. And we all have that right now. So don't feel like, oh, I don't have a teacher nearby. <laughs> we all have it right now, you know, with each other. I don't mean with the monastics. I mean, hopefully inclusive. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's everyone who can see everyone else here. Yeah. 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 You, know, you want to say anything? I'm talking a lot. No, that's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say a computer is also your friend. Oh, yes. Did you hear her say <laughs> that? <laughs> she found my weak weak spot. <laughs> she says computers are also my friend because it helps me. That's really true. Mm -hmm. Nothing against them, but I prefer humans. But anyway, it's true. Ajahn Brown gave a talk the other day. He said there was five hindrances. Actually, there's six. The five and the computer. <laughs> I agree with him on that, you know. I mean, he'd be not be able to do anything, any of that stuff that I do. It's not that bad with what he can do, he's quite good. But he couldn't do like websites and stuff. Like he's never had to. So yeah, I don't know. You're right. You have to defend everything. Sorry, I'm, I'm really talking too much. I should stop and give you a chance to comment or complain. <laughs> Yeah. It's nice actually to be doing the city class again. Yeah. Okay, I continue. Again, a monastic is easy to correct and possesses qualities that make them easy to correct. They are patient and receive instruction respectfully. Patient and receive instruction respectfully. You have to be patient, right? To receive instruction respectfully. Since a monastic is easy to correct, or anybody, and possesses qualities that make them easy to correct, they are patient and receive instruction respectfully. Mm. This is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of clear, yeah. right? Mm. I mean, not that we should just do things that we don't feel are ethical, definitely. But sometimes we might be asked to do something we don't understand why, but maybe it's just nice to do it so the other person doesn't have to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we receive them respectfully. So of course that creates respect, right? Because if we receive them respectfully, then we also give that person respect. They tend to respect us back. And there's times for being the receiver and times for giving the instruction, I guess. But in my role, I'm often the one giving instruction these days, which is a bit, bit uh, uh, goes against the grain a bit. Uh, but it's interesting because we often think that the suffering is being told what to do, but actually it's both this kind of so can be suffering. Yeah, it's interesting. Both can challenge the sense of self because they're just positions we find ourselves in. And it's so easy, isn't it? If you're the one kind of, say, in a workplace and you have a boss and you're always being told what to do to feel like, oh, 
I'm the inferior one kind of thing, like I don't, the boss is a tyrant. And But from the boss's perspective, it might be like really kind of grating to have to sort of ask, but they, but it's just a role that you're there in because you might be in a different workplace where you're, you know, ahead of someone else and then they're in a role. So it's actually less personal than we think it is. And it's just roles that we adopt. So maybe that's one reason that it's helpful. I realize, you know, sometimes that I wasn't the most helpful person to my abbot in Perth sometimes because sometimes I mean I did what I was told actually I didn't not do what I was told but I didn't always kind of particularly respect it I'm not sure what it was but now I can see that it's so much nicer for the person in the abbot's role if people just say yeah sure and that's it I don't know anyway I guess I see both sides much better now to see both sides I'm not into like I'm not into like being a time you know kind of not into really strong hierarchies but I guess you have to um have respect yeah and have faith really in that person that that, that person means well and the person really? means well yeah the person means really, well yeah mm. most people do. most people mean most well people but there do. are also situations where you don't want to do. You don't want to do what you're asked to do, even by someone you respect. And I think that's mm-hmm. important, actually, mm-hmm. because I remember one time in India, and um, mm-hmm. I was on this ten day retreat, and the woman was smoking in the room. Mm-hmm. And um, you're not meant to smoke, and you're not even meant to write or do anything like that. And um, mm-hmm. I could see she was having a hard time, and she smelled so badly of cigarettes. And the teacher asked me to go to her room and find the cigarettes. And I just said, I can't, I can't do it. I just don't feel I can do that because that's going into somebody's room. And I just kind of felt it wasn't right. And I was pretty firm in that. I mean, not in a disrespectful way, but I just, Mm. honestly, I asked myself, can I do it? And I just felt it isn't, it isn't, um, Mm. what's the word, congruent for me to do it. And I just Mm. said, no. And they sort of insisted it was a very grave thing and she really should be, it should be proven that she was smoking, but... I guess I also didn't think it was this massive breakage of sealer that they thought it was. They thought it was a huge breakage of sealer. And I think that was slightly cultural too. Whereas to me, it was like, well, it's you shouldn't do it, but it's not actually a breakage. And in the end, she was asked to leave the retreat and she was devastated. And she said she'd just started to get the practice. She'd just started to understand it. And she wouldn't do it again. And she understood. And... Um, but it was too late. They asked her to leave. And uh, I remember her saying to me, you just want control because she thought it was me. And I said, I don't. I just want people to be happy. <laughs> I don't know. It was, it was an awkward situation. So I, in that situation, I was very glad, actually, that I didn't do that because there was no need mm-hmm. to kind of expose her in a, in a mm-hmm. humiliating way. Mm-hmm. Anyway, just an example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any comments or questions or thoughts around this? We haven't heard too much from the group today. So far now. Hello. Hi. Hello. No, this is very interesting. Thanks for sharing this story because, again, uh, there are rules and uh, which are there for a reason, for a very good reason. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes you might miss the reason, like maybe nobody was thinking about why that woman was uh, behaving that way. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get into too much into the details, but mm-hmm. I think, uh, yeah, it's important to, I might be wrong, but uh, it's important to uh, understand the rules and follow them to the best of our abilities, but also understand why they are there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and try maybe to to really help ourselves mm-hmm. and, and others. Right, right. I have lots of problems with rules myself. I have problems with rules. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like everybody, maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I agree. Even the word rule, I have a problem with a bit because it seems so imposed and. I kind of think you have to know why you're doing it exactly like you say, you know, otherwise it doesn't really train the mind. I mean, it's enforced. So you're doing it because it's been told. But if you don't understand the reason, you're only doing it because you've been told. And when you're not being told, you won't do it. So <laughs> it's not going to stick. You know, it's the habits we cultivate and train because we understand them that actually last. We have to see the benefit for ourselves and others. And 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in that case with her, I remember saying to me, I'm a clown in my life. She was a clown. She was a clown. So she said, I'm a clown, you know, I don't. Yeah, she was, I suppose, just saying that she is unconventional and she's doing her best and it wasn't easy for her to come there and just can't we forgive the thing, you know? And uh, I just thought, yeah, it's not the end of the world. Um, so, yeah, sometimes we have to always see things in context. And actually, as far as other rules go, say, like, going by the monastery rule, for me, in, at times in some places, it wasn't actually in accord with my understanding of Buddhism, some aspects. Because some were like, you do what you're told because that's a good way to train. And that's actually not my understanding of the Buddha's teaching. I understood him to be someone that did... Um, actually elicit inquiry and say do question so it was more for me that than it was more like a feeling of not being able to practice the path that I love actually in the way that feels congruent um than because I'm not like oh I won't do what you say you know I don't, I don't really do that uh, I did as a teenager <laughs> but I have my reasons <laughs> <laughs> Mm. um so yeah so i think there's some things in the box that i've missed let me just see uh right oh yes a few things so just going back a little bit with reference to the pali translation bhikkave is given plural for male monastics curiously the sutta has parallels in the arguments in both versions gender neutral bhikkhui mm. i mean i won't be able to say it properly is given very nice Bikwi, and that's gender neutral, is it? Mm. Should we call ourselves Bikwis? <laughs> that sounds lovely. We're all Bikwis. <laughs> <laughs> Likely contributing to Bantasajata's translation using mendicants. Yeah, he uses mendicants, like arms mendicants. It's, it's okay too. Yeah, monastic sounds like you live in a monastery. Mendicant sounds like you live on arms. But actually, we live in monasteries, quite frankly. Anyway, interesting. Bikku and Bikuni is pretty standard in Pali, Sanskrit, or Hindu. For male and female monastics, is that right? Mm -hmm. Buddhist monastics, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, Buddhist monastics. I remember going as a Burmese mm -hmm. nun and doing retreats in mm -hmm. India, and they called us bhikkhunis. Mm -hmm. I had to say we weren't bhikkhunis, but yeah, they use bhikkhunis, true. Mm -hmm. Very strict rules sometimes mistakenly can become ends in themselves, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's usually when we don't understand the purpose. Mm -hmm. It's usually, I've noticed at the beginning of, of the practice, for people because they're taking them off faith maybe but haven't quite understood mm -hmm. why and maybe there's more fear of doing something wrong because you haven't got such a deep understanding of your own you're not so confident in your own ethical integrity yet which is normal and natural but I've noticed that when people mature in monastic life they become much more able to kind of trust their own intentions and um, and use their own wisdom and compassion to interpret the context and some of the meanings of the rules. So yeah, bhikkhave is evocative plural, used to address or call out somebody like, hey, bhikkhave, hey. <laughs> yeah, bhikkhave means hey bhikkhus, yeah, or hey monastics, or, well, bhikkhave really means a homeless one, doesn't it? Bhikkhave, oh, it means arms mendicant, doesn't it? Bhikkhu means arms, mendicant, I think. Yeah. Anyway, that's probably not yeah. a point of interest for the majority. <laughs> Can we come to um, Bill? Hi. Hi. I have two questions. <clears throat> when you talk, when you were talking about being in public and how the um, monks and nuns are held to a higher standard, when uh, we as lay people are accompanying you in places, how can we be more supportive to you in some respects? I, I guess when, it, you know, it, it, I just was, when you said that, it kind of made me think, how, how, how does that play out in public? And that if you're held to a higher standard and whatever, if, some, if somebody is with you, do, is there something that we as individuals could do to 
to, to, to be supported. So, yeah, I didn't quite hear you, actually. Did you get all of that? Which um, point was it in general? Did you say something about health? No, how can they help like in public? How can, yeah. people... how can you support us to have good conduct in public? Was that the idea? Be because you're held to a higher standard just because oh, of your held to a higher standard. Right, right, right. Don't people judge. do ask that, actually. Did you say don't judge? <laughs> I think that's a good one, though, actually. I think that's actually spot on because sometimes people do um, ask that. And I always say, well, it's actually our business to observe the Vinaya. It's not the lay people's business to do that. And the thing is, everybody's read it in a certain way and interpreted it in a certain way. And if you're not practicing, you don't really understand the context. So actually, I totally agree that mm. it's more about not judging the monastic. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if you just feel it's a matter of, oh, they don't quite look like a monastic should look or they talk a bit loud or something like that, that's probably judgment. But then obviously if there's a monastic who's like, you know, about to use money because nobody's there to use it for them, then, you know, please help them. Or, um, you know, if they are hungry and, and they don't know where they're going to eat and it's coming up to midday, then please, you know, if you can offer them something, that kind of thing is wonderful. Um, to I guess not to talk loudly to sort of engage them in really loud kind of boisterous chatter in public would be helpful uh, because you know we try to be mindful and be kind of a little bit self-contained especially maybe when walking around in public not always but you know a bit right I mean you don't wave your arms around and shout for example and actually I had had um, a guest once who decided to take issue with something that she was wrong about actually she got her information wrong and she started shouting at me in a park to the point that I actually started crying and afterwards I thought this is really really not good to see a lay person shouting at a monastic in public not because it's I mean I didn't like it I didn't like it at all but um <laughs> it actually really up upset me because she got it wrong anyway um but it was more like what sort of public image does that give? So actually, yeah, one way that lay people can support us in public is to be good examples also. Because you're, our mona you're our companions. So in a way, once you're associated with monastic, you also are a little bit of an example. You become a little bit of an example. And there was another person I, and this is exceptions, right? Because most of the time our lay supporters are absolutely fantastic and inspire us. But there was one time that... Um, I went out with someone and they got kind of low blood sugar and went to a cafe to ask for something. And they got really angry with the person at the till because they made, I don't know, didn't heat it up or something. They got really quite aggressive and I felt awful standing there as a monastic, sort of associated with that, you know. So, yeah, maybe to behave quite circumspectly. If you can. Does that help a bit? Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, cool. Being nice. I, I really think the don't judge as well. Is that what you said? Yeah, 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 good one. Nice one. Anything else to um, add? And Either way. Uh, does my smoking bother you? No, you're not in the room. What if you're in the room? I would never smoke. <laughs> Personally, I think that's your business. I mean, you're not actually in a dhamma hall. So I personally think it's kind of your business. I mean, I don't know what other people think. It's nice of you to ask. Um, seeing a bit of smoke on the screen doesn't bother me. I think, I mean, I know you're sincere and you've come here to learn the dhamma and that's what I feel from you. That's your energy. Yeah. I think it'd be more disturbing if somebody was getting up and down and going to have tea and talking to someone else with their sound off. And that would be more disturbing to me because that would be like not respectfully listening to the Dhamma. Mm. Thanks for asking. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so Hugo says, it's a, a, I think it's good to know the Patimoka a little bit and it makes you more comfortable when with monastics and helps mm -hmm. them to be comfortable themselves in public. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to know it a little bit, but to understand the monastics are the ones practicing it. So sometimes lay people say, you shouldn't do that, should you? You should do it this way. And that's kind of a bit strange. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to ask, right? But yeah, yeah, it's okay to ask in certain contexts. Yeah. 
good. Yeah, I think it is nice to know. I mean, I definitely read it before I ordained. And the first thing I did when I took the first temporary ordination, because I was between my final year, it was just before my final year of my degree, which I, I kind of felt I owed it to people to complete, people that were supporting me. Uh, so I took ordination for three months. That was in 2004. And the uh, first thing I asked my teacher was, can I have the Patimoko? And he gave me his personal, very falling apart copy. And it was like, oh, even in the Pali year, actually, with Lena, I remember getting hold of that. And that was my kind of, I was really disciplined and very much, I mean, I'm not on that way. I think I've just like loosened around it somehow. But yeah, I was really keen to kind of train myself, even as a lay person, actually with eating and not licking the lips and all that sort of stuff yeah anyway anyway we will get through this one probably so we've now got those qualities that make us easy to correct i ought to have emphasized that really because this is actually mm. super super mm. super key to ordaining anyone they have to be easy to correct in fact the buddha goes so far as to say that if somebody can't receive feedback without say counter feedback retaliation anger etc mm -hmm. they cannot be trained I mean it doesn't mean they never show those things but it's like if you can't talk to a person if they're not willing to receive feedback in other words if they're not willing to change in a sense and like take on the advice okay they can't take it on perfectly they might be a bit you know fed up at first mm -hmm but they have to be trying, right? Then he says they can't be trained. They're actually dead in the dispensation there as if dead. Mm. So that's a really important one. And it, you know, it's about humility too, because it can go both ways, right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. So again, a monastic is skillful and diligent in attending to the diverse chores that are to be done for their fellow monastics. That's nice, isn't mm. it? They possess appropriate mm. investigation there. In other words, they ask you how you want your cup of tea. Mm. They investigate how mm. big a cup, how much tea, how, what kind of milk. <laughs> I really think it includes mm. that. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and they're able to carry out and arrange everything properly. Yeah. Mm. That's really nice, isn't it? When someone looks mm. out for you and gives you a drink or brings you your hot water like when Lupeka does for me or checks out what kind of thing you can or can't eat and uh, yeah the fact that we are doing things for one another too and we're able to carry them out and arrange everything properly since one is skillful and diligent in attending to the diverse chores that are to be done for his fellow their fellow monastics mm -hmm. they possess appropriate investigation there and are able to carry out and arrange everything properly. This is a principle of concord, or sorry, cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not to mention how it smooths the smooth things, right? It makes mm -hmm. the day very easy. Maybe your sitting cloth's in place, or somebody's packed your bowl up ready to go off on Pindapat, or yeah. Whatever it is, you know, it's like we're looking out for each other. Like, what can we actually do to like, attend on each other? And honestly, our guests here are wonderful. They like grace every day. She's probably I'm saying this now because it's important. To, uh, she every day kind of asks, OK, is there anything else you need while you eat, etc.? No worries. Please leave if you need to go. See you next time. Uh, and, and then, yeah. And then Annette, who's also here, popped out from the screen. She... Uh, brought up my evening tea and uh, things I need and oh it's so nice it's so nice it, it reduces stress it reduces busyness it makes you feel cared for so we kind of purposely look out for what we can do now I like this one very much that sentence I remember okay I just read it <laughs> I'm very excited today okay <laughs> Again, a monastic loves the Dhamma <laughs> and is pleasing in their assertions or yeah, assertions, 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 filled with a lofty joy pertaining to the Dhamma and discipline. Since a monastic loves the Dhamma and is pleasing in their assertions, filled with a lofty joy pertaining to the Dhamma and discipline, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. So we love the Dhamma. 
I remember years ago, my friend who was a nun with me in Burma, she, um, we were talking about, and we weren't actually thinking about it, but you do talk about all these sorts of things. She said, oh, if I had a student or, you know, say if I was, I don't know, a Vipassana teacher and, you know, bringing someone else in to be a teacher, what, what would I look for? I'd say, I would ask them one thing, do you love the Dhamma? And I thought, what a brilliant mm -hmm. question. Like, not, oh, how long have you been practicing? Like, mm -hmm. what do you think about this particular principle mm -hmm. of philosophy? Da, da, da. This particular Dhamma point. Do you love the Dhamma? You know, it's like that. Do you love it? Like, is there that heart connection? It's kind of almost like asking, do you have sadda, mm -hmm. isn't it? Maybe that's why I think wisdom and faith are so close. Because mm -hmm. to me, it's like love. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like whatever you know becomes, becomes love. It goes in the heart. It goes into the heart. I don't know. That's not very articulate, but it's, you know, you can't articulate those kind of things very easily. <laughs> but I just love that. I just, yeah, when it says a, a monastic loves the Dhamma, I feel immediately very happy to read that. Pleasing in their assertions, filled with a lofty joy pertaining to the Dhamma and discipline. So that shows you you're getting something from it, right? Otherwise, you have it hasn't really hasn't really gone in. It's like you sort of know it's interesting or it could help you in theory, and you kind of, but it hasn't like touched the heart, opened the heart, and it's that that causes you to give your life to it, isn't it? It's that sort of. What would you say? Looking at Annette's face. I'm looking at Annette's face. <laughs> yeah, she's full of sadda. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's very beautiful because obviously you're gonna like be a bit contagious we had another guest here recently she was one of our bookkeepers we've got two and uh she said uh uh oh yeah she's she's in kind of a serious family they're a bit serious and uh and then she started to get all happy that she was with us and she said I've got gigalitis I'm getting gigalitis it was so cute wasn't it it was really cute. It was like this kind of, yeah, bubbling up of joy. <laughs> it's really sweet. Anyway, anything else to say about that? Nothing yet? Okay. Now, I'm not sure if this comment is just for me, for me directly. Is it to me directly? Probably. Okay. I'll read that just to me directly. Okay. So nobody else can see that long message in the box, I guess. Okay. It's sort of somebody's personal experience. I think they, they um, want to share. Okay. So again, a monastic has aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. They are strong, firm in exertion, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. Since a monastic has Aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. They are strong, firm in exertion, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. This is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. So here's the right efforts in two, the four right efforts into two. So he's actually not talking here about. Um, about stopping unwholesome things coming in or about increasing wholesome things, because in this case, the monks already have them. They already have unwholesome things, so they're already there. So he's emphasizing abandoning the unwholesome and acquiring the wholesome. So it suggests to me that maybe there's a bit of a deficit there at this time in those, in those people. So first we have to abandon the unwholesome and acquire the wholesome. So not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. The duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. Quite interesting, isn't it? Maybe we have a duty to our fellow monastics, the people in our societies. You know, yes, it feels good, but it's also a sense of responsibility to others to do that. Uh, Maybe I'll read through the rest. We could always talk about it next week. Shall I do that? It's a sense of completion, isn't it? 
if we do that, yeah. Again, a monastic is content with any kind of robe, arms, food, lodging, and medicines and provisions for the sick. Since a monastic is content with any kind of robes, arms, food, lodging, and medicines and provisions for the sick, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. So you're not demanding on the community. You're not um, standing out in a way. Right? You're content. Again, a monastic is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness. One who remembers and recollects what was done and said long ago, which links back to the first point about remembering what we're meant to be doing. Since a person is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness, one who remembers and recollects what was done and said long ago, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. Again, a monastic or anyone else is wise. They possess the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Since a person is wise, possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering, this is a principle of cordiality that creates affection and respect and conduces to unity. These monastics are the 10 principles of cordiality that create affection and respect and conduce to cohesiveness, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. <laughs> it's almost another gradual training, isn't it? It's mm. almost another version of the gradual training, starting with Sila, but here starting with the Patimokka, because these are monastics. And then actually, yeah, remembering what we've learned. So that preliminary mindfulness and the wise association with conditions. So we need to have good companions. Being easy to correct. So this is very specific to the training in monastic life. But I think anywhere, I mean, if you go to the workplace, you know, or even in your family, if you, you can't take anybody else's input or feedback, you're not going to be easy to work with. It's probably a quality they look for when you're um, filling out your CV. Uh, and then, yeah, I like that one about looking after each other, looking out for those little things you can do for each other, loving the Dhamma. So now we're getting into the happiness, right? Arousing energy for the wholesome, content with any kind of robe. So it's all getting into like some inner happiness now. And we're mindful, right? Because we're, we're clean inside, we've become mindful. And then we start to even see the rising and passing away of everything and break through to the complete end of suffering. So it's very beautiful, very uplifting, I'm sure, for those monks who were stabbing each other with verbal daggers. They still have hope. The Buddha still thought he could teach them all the way up to Nirvana. So, yeah, going back to the Patimaka. And I guess this is something we have to completely... You know, we make mistakes, we start again. We make mistakes, we start again. <laughs> we review it again. We go back to the basics and remember what we should be doing. Yeah, there's still hope. There's always hope. Yeah. So any last comments or questions? Even from anything you'd like to say? Because I really did talk away. Or anything um, from people here? anything anything maybe it's just a satisfying mm. discourse i mm. hope that's the case mm -hmm. yeah people are nodding <laughs> have you ever practiced any of this in order to uh, bring about more harmony i wonder i'm mm. sure you have okay mm. i think we're pretty much through then so uh Thank you very much for your presence and practice and interest, etc. cetera. Uh, it's nice to see lots of old friends and new people as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there's anyone completely new here, but it's lovely to be together. And uh, yeah, I guess I hand over then to the person who's going to say a few closing words. <laughs> yeah, so... 
As you know, today's discussion is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And uh, if you are able to make any contributions, uh, you can um, donate and it's, it's very gratefully received and it will help to support uh, the running day-to-day -day running of the Vihara and you know that it's growing and we've got now two big kunis and we've got a community building up um, people coming visiting and um, the visitor, uh, there's longer staying guests there and also it's very important that it helps the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination um, and also um, it may, you know, we, we, we will definitely need funds to go to a bigger, bigger monastery um, in due course, as we can see that it's growing. Um, and I will now add the link uh, for donation in the box. Um, And if you are capable, you can provide a food dana to venerable uh, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, any guests who are there mm -hmm. by visiting the Vihara, or you can do it remotely. And also there are different ways of getting involved. Um, like there are different WhatsApp groups. You can uh, do the supermarkets. You can volunteer for one of things. So if you can contact team at uh, if you want to, get involved more maybe you can do volunteering in different ways and discuss about it that's the email address uh, and of course we've got so many events coming up and uh, events team uh, events uh, page gets updated uh, so have a look at the events page and if you want to do dana there's a dana calendar which is updated in the website as well thank you <laughs> wow thank you Manoi. you're so sorry that's amazing and Manoa has also been to stay recently for a whole week, which was absolutely lovely. And um, on the subject of volunteers, I mean, next year at least, and maybe for the future, I'm not going to be organising all these events for Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali myself. I do like 90% of it myself, at least in the beginning anyway. And then Annie kind of watches the email and like does all the responses to people. And it's it's impossible to run a monastery and to do all that, you know, without a big team of people. So there are people, but they only have a, a couple of hours here and there, and it's a full-time job for a few people. So just to flag that, you know, that if people really want these things to happen, sometimes we have to you know, contribute. We have to actually say, this matters to me, I'm gonna make the time. And I know that, you know, so many of us, all of us probably are already overstretched, overworked, et cetera. I think that's the main reason that it's hard to find like, you know, half time or full time volunteers. I really get that, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, there's some roles I'm doing also volunteer manager. It's not really possible now running a monastery. So things will have to be prioritized and some things will have to kind of give way. So if we want to develop this community on the ground, so just to flag that up and, you know, maybe you even know people who might have expertise in these areas. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the other thing is that uh, uh, it's not public yet, but myself and Venerable Pekka will do a little day retreat for mm -hmm. everyone in person in Cambridge on July, June, June the 17th, June the 17th. Oh, Shirley's looking happy because she's not far from Cambridge, is it? Yay, mm -hmm. Anne and Shirley. Wonderful. Hi, yeah. Anne and Shirley. <laughs> so we'll do a little day retreat. It's the 17th, isn't it? Saturday, the 17th of June. To be Not to be confirmed, we booked the venue. It's the Friends Meeting House, the Quakers Meeting House in Cambridge. It's very pretty. And we got the whole place. Um, so Matthias is going to be with us at that time from Germany. And uh, anyone else who would like to come or help on the day? would be very, very welcome. So we'll be putting that out in a month or so at the very latest, um, but it's very hard for me at the moment with all the teaching and running of the monastery to get you know, everything ready in time for a newsletter to be very soon. So just put it in your diary because it'd be so nice to see everybody. It's the first time Anu Kampo will have organized a day retreat. Normally mm. it's done through the insight groups mm -hmm. and I just go toddle mm -hmm. along. 
but I think it's nicer when we do it ourselves because we reach out to our own community. So I hope it, it works. And it's a kind of goodbye to Venerable Pekka because she um, will be leaving a few days after that. So not forever, I hope. <laughs> she said no. <laughs> Not forever. <laughs> so great. So uh, we still have a minute to go, and you're all still here, and lots and lots of Meta and Karina and Medita and Upeka <laughs> to all of you. And if our wonderful people here would like to wave goodbye, you're welcome to come and literally wave. <laughs> it's up to you. It's kind of nice for people. Maybe it's nice for you to see people on the screen, people from all over the world. Pretty impressive. There's Erica. Yay, Erica. Hi. We miss you. I miss you. I love all our sort of discussions. I miss it. There's Erica. Oh, look, you're all there. Matthias, we need a picture. We need a photo. Screenshot. <laughs> Yay. That's it. You need to. That's you go a little bit. That's it. That's there it. Yay. Bye. Screenshot.